Oh, hey. Oh. We're live. We're live. Well, Calling Chris Anderson in... Where are we? We're in London. Wow. Calling with Fire in? London, I guess. Jeez. London. Wow, it's amazing. And uh, and that means we must not be live. No. Shh. Don't tell anybody. Where, where are we? Where we're, at, we're at my local. So... Oh, wow. Well, we're not doing History Happy Hour from the studio. This we, is where we, I come we, to think wow. big thoughts. This is and and we thank we 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 thank some we drank some we thank some <laughs> we, we thank some big draughts yes we did yeah yes, so to speak hey so uh, we're uh, getting ready to go to Normandy but we have a great encore episode today with Philippe Sands uh, talking about his book The Rat Line and I think you're going to really enjoy that it was really one of our best shows so far yeah so check that out and uh, you know uh, Chris maybe you should give us a cue for the open. The bar is open. The bar is open. The floor is yours. Ah, well, good. Well, I, um, as people have probably noticed, I was very, very, very excited about the show uh, this week. Uh, our guest this week is Philippe Sands. He's a professor of international law at the University College London and a barrister. He's also the author of several books, um, most notably for, for us uh, is East West Street, which was named Nonfiction Book of the Year by the British Book Awards. Uh, he's done a wonderful documentary called My Nazi Legacy, which bridges East West Street and the book we're going to talk about tonight, The Rat Line. Uh, he has written a podcast, which I urge you to listen to after you read The Rat Line. And more, most importantly, he is the author of The Rat Line, which the novelist John Le Carre called Unputdownable. And I have to say, I couldn't agree more. It's a fantastic book. Okay, so yeah, welcome, Philippe. It's so nice to be with you, Chris and Rick, also from freezing cold London. Yes. Oh, how yeah. cold is it? <laughs> it's well, pretty cold. <laughs> four and a half degrees or something, but for us that's freezing because we're English and we're not, we don't have the constitution of some of you Americans. <laughs> <laughs> you know what real cold is, we don't. This is, uh, <laughs> Nor do we want to. We don't want to talk about our constitution today. So. <laughs> so. Well, Philippe, thanks so much for joining us. Um, there's a whole lot to unpack about this book. And just, I guess, by way of introduction, I should say that I first got exposed to this um, when I saw Philippe speak at the Chelsea History Festival, which was all online this year. Um, the story absolutely blew me away. I immediately ordered the book, um, listened to the podcast, and decided that we really had to have him on to talk about this show. So um, I guess just to get the ball rolling here, in the podcast, in the book, Philippe, you talk about um, Otto von Vector, one of the central characters of the story. Mm. Um, you say he's not an ordinary Nazi. So what kind of Nazi is he? And just to kind of get things going, what you said as an introduction sure. to kind of sure. the start of this. Sure. So firstly, can I say it's incredibly nice to be here. And this is an audience that really matters for me. I'm a sort of wannabe historian uh, and speaking to anyone who's interested in history is absolutely fascinating for me. I mean, the rat line is really about the Vector family. Um, Otto, the father, Charlotte, the wife, very important role to my mind, and Horst, the son. Uh, you, on the photograph you're looking at now, he's the little boy who's sort of being semi-strangled by the guy in the SS hat, who's his dad, Otto, and the lady is, uh, the lady is Charlotte, and the little girl is Horst's sister, Trouter, named you'll be interested to know when you ask me what was otto like uh, trouter is named after one of otto's mistresses you can come back to that, uh, later on this is not an ordinary family but i think it's fair to say that otto vector was an absolutely top table nazi um he was a lawyer he was austrian he led the effort to uh insurrection coup call it what you will in 1934 uh, against the Austrian Chancellor, who was killed. It was unsuccessful. He fled. He comes back to Vienna in 1934. He's 38. He stands with Hitler in that famous balcony uh, in Vienna, the Heldenplatz. Um, he has a job for a year in the new Austrian government, the Nazi government of Austria. His job for a year is to remove all Jews 
and other political undesirables uh, from public office. He does his job well, so well, in fact, that he's then posted uh, by Hitler personally to be the governor of Krakow. And he is the one who orders the construction of and oversees the operation of the famous Krakow ghetto. Mm-hmm. He does that job so well that in February 42, he's sent to a city called Lemberg, also known as Lvov or Lviv, uh, which after Operation Barbarossa has been taken by the Germans from the Soviets. And he becomes governor of District Galicia, where his job is to oversee the implementation of the final solution, the murder of more than half a million people. Uh, unlike his boss, Hans Frank, when the war ends on the 9th of May, 45, he escapes. He disappears off the face of the earth. He is indicted for mass murder by the Americans, more than 100,000 uh, Poles and Jews, in excess actually of half a, half a million. Uh, and that is uh, Otto Wächter in a nutshell. The only other thing I'd say is highly intelligent, highly cultured. And one of the things that I think is important, and I stress it, not just a monster, a man who did monstrous things, but was also capable of love and generosity and humanity, and is beloved by his son Horst. And this is where the complexities arise. Well, and that's the where I was going to jump in and say, uh, and we want to explore some of what you talked about a little bit more. But uh, your entree to this is his son, Horst Vector. Um, and a significant part of the book is about your friendship with Horst and the tensions created by his view of his father versus your view of his father, as well as sort of your family history. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Horst and that dynamic? Sure. I, I think it's probably worth giving a moment's context. Most people won't have read sort of a prequel, if you want, uh, East West Street. One of the characters in the earlier book was a man called Hans Frank. Uh, and Hans Frank was the governor general of Nazi occupied Poland, defendant number seven at the Nuremberg trial, famously, personally Hitler's lawyer from 1928 to 1933. And he was Otto Wächter's boss, his immediate superior. Uh, and in writing East West Street, I came to know Hans Frank's son. Hans Frank was hanged at Nuremberg. Uh, and I came to know his son, Nicholas, who detests his father. The first time I met Nicholas, he said to me, you know, Philippe, I'm against the death penalty in all cases, except in the case of my father. He was a criminal and he deserved to be hanged, which is tough yeah. for a son to say. He knew I was interested in the city of Lemberg. And the reason behind all of these books is that my grandfather, Leon Buchholz, was born in Lemberg in 1904. And he lived to a ripe old age till 90, 1997. So I knew him very well. But he never once talked to me or my brother about what happened during the war or before basically because, as I learned, his entire family had been exterminated by Frank and Wächter. So there's a sort of personal uh, element, I would say, to all of this. And Nicholas Frank, the son of Hans Frank, understood the personal element. He said, you know, I'm very good friends with Horst Wächter, the son of my father's deputy, Otto Wächter. Would you like to meet him? So I said, sure. I don't know why he'd want to meet me, but happy to give it a go. And Horst said yes, and I liked Horst a lot. I met him 10 years ago for the first time in his dilapidated castle. And here you see him, actually. This is uh, this is in the main living room of his castle in northern uh, Austria, totally unheated. He's totally impecunious. This is the height of winter. It was minus three degrees indoors (laughs) when the photograph was taken. And I am fond of Horst, but I'm not fond of his views because although... I believe his father was a mass murderer. Um, His father was never caught. Uh, He was indicted, but never put on trial, uh, never convicted. And the consequence of that is that Horst says, my father's an innocent man, and it's my duty as a son to find the good in him. And one thing led to another. I started off, I wrote a piece, that photograph that you just showed appeared for the first time in the Financial Times magazine, an article that I wrote in 2013. Horst incidentally hated the article, said he would sever all relations with me. But a few weeks later, he came back and one thing led to another. And eventually, in about 2015, he he had had a, should we say, a little spat with Nicholas while we were making the BBC film you referred to, Chris, My Nazi Legacy, in which Nicholas said, well, Horst could be a new kind of Nazi. I don't think he is. 
if I thought for a moment that Horst was anti-Semitic or racist or anything like that, Holocaust denial, I wouldn't have anything to do with him. But he's not. He's genuinely a sort of damaged child who's looking for the good uh, in his father. So he was very put out by what uh, Nick said, Nick Frank said, and he said, what can I do to prove I'm not a Nazi, which uh, you know, any lawyer will tell you, it's very difficult to prove, any historian will tell you, very difficult to prove a negative. And I thought about it, and I said, well, you've got this incredible family archive. I've not seen it. Why don't you give it to a museum? He said, terrific idea. He said, which museum? I said, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, they'll treat the material really professionally, really well. He said, great idea. I match made them. They, he gave them the material. And he said, would you like the material? And I said, sure, why not? And uh, a single USB, 8,670 or so pages came through a couple of weeks. Real late reading. Yeah, and it took me five years to get through the material. And the material, as you know, you've read the book, is astonishing because I think one of the things I've learned from my cases, and I, I litigate cases about mass murder, crimes against humanity and genocide, is that very often the real interesting stuff is in the family archive. It's not in the public documents. And here we had a treasure trove of material from the moment Charlotta met Otto in 1929 until the moment he died in a Vatican-run hospital in the summer of 49 in Rome in the arms of a Vatican bishop. Everything, diaries, letters, poems, photographs. And it's an extraordinary trove of material. Well, you know, Philip, I wanted to ask you about that because obviously the archives they almost become a character of the story, you know. Um, how did they survive? You know, my experience has been that at the end of the war, anybody that even, you know, picked up a copy of Der Angriff on a newsstand is burning, destroying everything. But the this family saves everything. Right. Well, not uh, quite everything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not quite everything. We were talking earlier, Chris um, and Rick, about a, a town called Zell am Zee, yes. which I think you know very well, uh, which was where Charlotta and the children were living on the 9th of May 1945, in a house they'd basically stolen. Right. You know, pro it had been appropriated for them. A couple of days earlier, Otto, who knows the war is coming to an end, rings it. She records this in her diary. That's why we know. And he says, destroy everything, get rid of everything. Right. And she destroys all the official documents, so all the work archives, yeah. five years, oh, eight, eight, eight years of, of, of Nazi horror stuff. She throws it into, into the lake and it's gone forever. But she keeps the private material and she keeps it for a particular reason. As you know from the book, she decides she's going to devote the rest of her life to um, cleansing the reputation of her husband. And she needs the private archive to remind herself of how glorious it was. <laughs> so that material thankfully survives. Um, so I, I'm, I'm reminded here by a viewer that we neglected an important part of the show. We, we do sometimes fall flat here to ask everyone what they are drinking today on History Happy Hour. <laughs> So you have, is that a red wine you've got there, Philippe? It's a red wine. It's one of my favorite Italian red wines. Excellent. It's yeah. called Brunello di Montalcino. Yes. It's a gift from a friend. Well, and since some um, of our story takes place in Italy, that's appropriate, sure. Chris. As you would expect, it's my single malt. Excellent. <laughs> well done. And I am drinking a Hefeweizen as some of our story takes place in Germany uh, as well. Rick, um, Rick, I should say, if I had had time to prepare. Oh, I know. I did neglect to tell the you. The cocktail to, I like, would have made is what you guys call an old fashioned. Oh, uh, because nice. that was, we may we may come to Tom Lucid in due course. Yes, but Tom Lucid had an old fashioned prepared for him every evening in this crucial period by his young son, who I came to know, who today lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico. You have uh, <laughs> you have warmed the hearts of many with the choice of an old fashioned. Um, uh, we do have a, a more serious viewer question, and I think it's worth asking, even though it might take us out of our current discussion, which we can come back to, um, because uh, the, what essentially, the, what is the meaning of the title of your book? And I would add to that, that's a question from Doug, and I would add to that, because um, you can tell us the meaning, why you chose that 
as the title because you could have chosen a lot of other yeah. things instead. Yeah, so I have known Horst for 10 years. For the first five years, I think it's fair to say my focus of attention was what he did until the moment the war ended because I wanted to know what he did in Krakow, in Rome, in, did, yeah. in, in, in Lemberg. I suddenly get this pile of documents at the end of 2014. And all of a sudden I discover that as interesting or perhaps even more interesting is what happened after the war. All I had known was that he disappeared off the face of the earth. And he reappears four years later on the 13th of July, 1949, in a hospital room in Rome, Vatican run hospital, dying of uh, it's one of the mysteries in the book. And all of a sudden, I have before me four and a half years of correspondence and diaries as to what happened. And so for the f I think it's fair to say for the first time, we've got the inside story of how a senior, very senior Nazi officer, SS Brigade Führer, one rank below Heinrich Himmler, his mentor, literally one notch down, what happened when he tried to escape. And that story in a nutshell is that he hides in the Austrian mountains for three and a half years or three years with a young Waffen SS soldier. We can come back to talk about him because unbelievably he was still alive while I was writing the book and I met him and spent time interviewing him. He then leaves the mountains where he's looked after by his wife Charlotte, in a rather her heroic but also ghastly way. Uh, and decides that he wants to make his way on what the Nazis called the Reich Migratory Route, aka the Rat Line, the path from Rome and Genoa to South America, the path uh, flown by people like Eichmann and Mengele and Priebke and Barbie to basically flee indictment and arrest and head mainly for Argentina, but some other countries also, Chile, Ecuador, and other countries. And the rat line refers to that escape route. And that's the second half of the book. But you're absolutely right. And as you both will know very well, choosing a title is something that is fraught with difficulty. I had started off with this material making a BBC podcast, which as Chris mentioned, any, anyone can listen to it. It's free on the BBC website. It, it's had millions of, of listeners. And, it's called the rat line and that came out in 2018 so two years two and a half years before the book mm -hmm. and we debated should we give it a different name for the book or the same name and the view in the end which i think has been shown to be the right decision is give it the same name because so many people had heard of the podcast that the publishers took the view they would also buy the book i was concerned that people would say ah you know we know the story we don't want to go that route but in fact as you know the book is rather different uh, and rather fuller than the podcast and so that was the decision so the rat line is a part of the story but you, you know it, it, it could have had it. it's absolutely right yeah it's really a book of 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 layers i mean it's it's there's different story threads and different layers and it's what makes it so fascinating and so compelling so well it's a love story you know h horrible to say because these are pretty ghastly but fascinating characters um but they love each other and uh, it's also a story about lies how families lie to each other lie to themselves about what has happened in the past um and that aspect of it is complex right now because the publication of the book has of course caused for the family in austria today the children and the grandchildren the great-grandchildren should we say, um, issues about silence. But it's also a book about justice because Otto was never caught. He was indicted for mass murder, but he was never caught. And in a sense, the book is a judgment of my own on what he did. So it's, it's, it is, as you say, it's, it's multi-layered, it's complex. Well, you know, Philippe, one of the, well, you and I were talking before the show and we, I, I mentioned that I go to Zellamse a lot, obviously. Um, in the book, they talk about uh, Charlotte and the, and the children being there and there's a wonderful scene or moment in the book where it's the end of the war um, 
Charlotte is there and Zelimze, an American comes up to you and asks, well, are, are there any Nazis here? And she says, well, I'm a Nazi. And, and you know, the, the American kind of is taken aback because he said, you're the first person that's admitted that. Uh, <laughs> first person know, in Germany. Funny, it's the only Nazi. Nazi. Uh, um, so first of all, you know, my mind immediately is like, I wonder if I knew the person that met Charlotte. Uh, but moving on from that is just this incredibly brassy, unrepentant woman. Um, could you tell us a little bit about where she's coming from and all this? Because you know, extraordinary, yeah. extraordinary character. I mean, I, I, I've got. A, I mean, at one point when I when I when I went, I, went, I mean, I spent a lot of time with Horst. And at one point, his late wife, Jacqueline, said to me as I was leaving, you know, Philippe, she was a Nazi until the day she died in 1985. Mm. And this, of course, we now know because uh, the, the archive includes her later materials. And, right. You know, she's looking back to the glory days. So she was an absolutely proud, uncompromising, unremitting Nazi. Those were the best days of her life. She got to go to the opera with Hitler and with Goering, and she got to go to the Salzburg Festival and all the places you and your, you know, viewers, listeners love to go. Mm -hmm. um, and yet she was also a mother and a wife and a daughter and a daughter-in-law. And she brought up six children after the war in great, you know, times of real difficulty. And the son that I know, Horst, loves her to bits. And the true story, I think, of his denial of what his father did is a reflection, I think, not of his love of his father. Horse would sometimes say to me, no, I didn't really know my father. It's my mother. My mother loved my father so much that I need to express my love of my mother by recognizing that love and transferring it into a respect for my father. But what she did was extraordinary. I mean, she totally supported him through the dark days before the Anschluss, when they lost power, to the moment when they reconvene in Vienna. There's an extraordinary moment on the 15th of March, 1938, when they're standing with Hitler on the balcony of the Heldenplatz. She writes in her diary, I am standing one meter from the Fuhrer. So it's that kind of proximity to power. But it's what happens next that's so fascinating to me. They go inside the building, the Hofburg, you know it, you've seen it, they walk down the huge marble staircase. It's a museum now. Any member of the public can go. And at the bottom of the staircase, and I stood there and imagined the moment, he turns to her and he says, so my darling, um, I've got a choice. I'm back from Berlin. I could carry on my lucrative life and career as a lawyer, or I could uh, accept the position in government that Seiss Inkwart, the new governor of Austria, Ostmark as it was called, has offered me removing Jews from public office. And she says, take the job in government. That's <laughs> so she's, you know, it's not that she's like this innocent, lovely, right. foul-like creature who's just going with the wind. She is absolutely pushing. She is sewing swastikas onto tablecloths and napkins at kids' parties. And it's Throughout the war, she is his staunchest supporter. There's a letter right at the end, uh, spring 1945. They know the end is coming. And they're still writing to each other two or three times a week. And she says, look, this is ridiculous. The Soviet Red Army is about to you know, engulf all of the areas that we have occupied. Why don't we cut a deal with the British? Why don't we turn against the Soviets and enter an alliance? She loves the English. She loved the English. And then she writes in the letter, no, of course, it's impossible. That's never going to happen because of the Jews. They're always contaminating everything. So she's got this sort of fantasy world that but for the Jews, they would be in alliance with the British against the Red Army. And she's absolutely pushing them. But it's what happens after the war that I think is so extraordinary yeah. because he disappears. And what I learned through the material is that she, not so far from Zell and Salzburg, is going every two weeks over the course of 36 hours, climbing mountains, literally, to obscure huts, the Hagener Hütte and other ones, places near to where you've been, Chris, and you may now want to visit some of these. I places. do, actually. <laughs> um, they're amazing places. 
New tour. <laughs> no, well, they hid for three years. And every two weeks, she's bringing provisions, food, clothing, skis, and she's bringing the newspapers. And he wants the newspapers for two reasons. He wants the sports pages, and he wants to find out what's going on with the Nuremberg trial because all his mates are on trial at Nuremberg. It's completely fascinating. Are, are they comment? Is there anything in the paper where, you know, Otto says to Charlotta, hey, I just found out what they did at yes. Nuremberg. Yes. How do they react to that news? Well, it was even better than that because, um, so Otto, you know, he was a brigade Führer. He was a governor. He was not a mountain survivor. In a small Austrian town called Maria Pfarr, a couple of days after the war ends, he comes across. Now, I use my words carefully because I think actually the meeting was set up for him by one of the most ghastly of all characters, a guy called Odilo Globochnik, who actually constructed all of the extermination camps on the territory of Poland, Nazi occupied Poland. And he is, um, he, he meets a young Waffen SS soldier called Burkhard Ratman. This is, you know, 11th, 12th of May, 1945. And Ratman says to him, I'll take you to a place where the British and the Americans who are hunting you and me, uh, Ratman has been killing partisans uh, in Italy and in Yugoslavia, and he's a mountain killer. He's part of an SS unit which operates in high uh, altitude alpine type areas. So he knows how to survive above 2,000 meters, above 6,000 feet. And Ratman says to him, I'll take you to a place where the British and the Americans are too lazy uh, to go, too stupid to find us. We'll go up. We go up in the mountains. And he takes them, and it's all recorded, all of the places that they went, and hid for three years. And at a certain moment, I said to this was about 2016, I said, actually, it was, I remember it well, it was December 2016. I said to Horst, what was this Ratman guy like? Buko, why, why did he look after your dad? Did, they, did he stay in touch with the family? you know, later on in the 50s and the 60s. Um, what motivated him? What do you do during the war? And Horst looks at me, smiles, and he says, well, Philippe, I can answer all of your questions or we could telephone Buko. <laughs> so I'm thinking, this is, 2000, this is December 2016. It is 71 years after these events. I said, what do you mean? He said, yeah, yeah, he lives in central Germany. He lives in a place called Kassel in central Germany. And we can call him. So I said, well, let's call him. So we called him and he invited us to come and see him, which we did a month later in January. I've never had a day like it. I mean, I asked him as you were reading the newspapers and all Otto's mates are going through the trial and they're being convicted and they're being hanged. What was your reaction? And mm -hmm. Luca looks at me and he says, Vi victis, to the victor, the spoils. That is justice. So they followed the entire trial. And of course, it underscored, because this is 46, right. their desire to survive. Wächter knew that if he was caught, 100% he was going to be hanged, because he was at the same level of every single person who was hanged. Um, and you just have to tell us, uh, you're, you're talking to this, this Nazi who helped Vector, what his one condition was for the interview. Well, I mean, I'll tell you about his one condition, and I'll tell you about his bookshelf. Um, because the one condition was that I ask no question about anything that happened before 9th of May, 1945. So and, nothing, nothing from the war or before the war, nothing. And when I was with him, I came to understand, because his daughter told me, he wakes up every day. He's passed away. He passed away last year. He wakes up every day worrying he's going to get the tap on the shoulder and he will be indicted. And of course, he was not wrong because just this week they've announced the indictment of some hundred year old guy in Germany yeah. for events back then. So he, his daughter said, the moment you ask anything before 9th of May 45, the interview is over. But I've got to share with your uh, listeners and viewers one other thing. I'm interviewing him for about six hours straight he's in his wheelchair and and he's sitting in front of his bookshelf and i'm sort of you know you've both of you've done interviews you're you don't want to get up you don't want to go and peer around and see what's on the shelf 
but I'm sort of looking at the books and trying to see, you know, they're, they're old books. What are the, what's the titles of the books? And there's some photographs and there's little boxes. And only after the interview is over, do I go behind him. I look inside the boxes, sort of iron cross type things. You'll know better than I do exactly what they are, but it's the photograph. Adolf Hitler sitting there, January, 2017. I put a photograph of it in the book actually because yeah. i was so stunned by it um so 72 years later you know the fuhrer was uh, beaming from a bookshelf Whew. um is it oh, go ahead. can i can i can i go, you can go ahead. okay and, and i should remind everybody uh, that we are here uh on history happy hour and we're talking to philippe sands who is the author of the book the rat line as well as the podcast. And, and Philippe, I, I do want to mention that um, you've, you've written, uh, I think, 17 books, documentary, podcast, plus your day job as an international lawyer. Please stop, okay? Because you are making the rest of us look pretty bad right now. So, um, But I want to, we have a, a comment from a, a, a viewer, and I want to start with that and then go to a question of mine. Uh, and Valerie says, getting to know in detail the personal story of a family must be haunting and and so I imagine that that's true and and I also I was struck when I was reading uh, the book uh, by a comment that uh, uh, if you know the author Keith Lowe he was on our show a couple of weeks ago and in his book Fear and Freedom he wrote uh, it remains a struggle to remind people that it was not monsters but ordinary people who oversaw the Holocaust yeah. and your book forces us to see Otto and Charlotte as human beings which is a little uncomfortable because if they're not monsters then it means that we can't just put this all off on monsters. Any of us could be a monster. So it's a little bit scary there. That's part of the purpose. Um, you know, the first book, I mean, most of the books that I've written are academic books that sell, if I'm lucky, about nine copies. And I'm totally thrilled about that. You know, that doesn't bother me at all. Nine is great. I mean, nine that's is great. <laughs> awesome copies. That's great. And then I, things happen. I wanted to reach a broader audience. And so I went into a different style, which I've enjoyed a lot but one of the things that was important to me in east west street and the rat line with hans frank and otto vecht it was precisely that point here are highly cultured highly intelligent human beings who have crossed lines and i wanted to explain how it is that regular folk can end up doing terrible things because i do think and I know this from the cases that I've done in Rwanda and Yugoslavia and Argentina and Chile and so many parts of the world, that I think in theory, anyone has the capacity to be in a position where they cross a line. And the story of Vector is the story of multiple lines crossed. Once you've crossed one line, it becomes so much easier to cross another. And then once you've crossed two or three, the logic of the situation you find yourself in is, hey, we'll kill 50 people. That's what he first does. In December 1939, he, he is involved in the first act of reprisal killing in occupied Poland, personally ordered by Adolf Hitler. 50 Polish soldiers, 50 Polish civilians, young men, um, executed 25 for each German. Two Germans were killed in a town called Bochnia. And that is what interests me. It's the juxtaposition between the engagement on the same day of Wächter in mass murder. And he writes the same afternoon, a loving letter home to his wife. And his wife writes back to him saying, it's marvelous, we're in nature, we're on the Schmittenhoa near Zelamze, it's so beautiful. And it's not right to say that Wächter was a monster. Wächter did monstrous things. They are crimes. They're crimes on a massive scale. But, and this is the complexity, he was also capable of generosity, humanity, and decency. And that's the problem. And I think that's the warning for all of us in all of our communities, how people cross lines and where things go wrong. And that's really a central theme that I'm in. So I very much accept Jim Lowe's characterization. Some people are critical of that. Um, some of you will have seen an extraordinary film called Downfall, which yeah. is the sort of last days of Adolf Hitler. And that book got, that, that film got the critique that it humanized Adolf Hitler. I, and I've got no problem with that because he was human. And 
human beings kill people in large numbers, not states, not governments. And that, I think, is what we have to keep the accent on. And it's trying to understand the family, you know, group and how the family group, in effect, um, is complicit. The father, the wife, the sister, by turning a blind eye. And this is where you've got such a difference between Horst Wächter and Nicholas Frank, because Nicholas Frank's view is that his mother was complicit by enabling her husband, Hans Frank, to do what he did, hanged for the murder of four million human beings, three million Jews and a million Poles, that, that hangs over the family for the rest of the family's existence. Uh, but it was a family decision. Well, one of the, Philippe, one of the things that I was interested in, because um, it just kind of scratches the niche for me, I'd like your thoughts on Frank's son obviously grew up in Germany. And, and there's not a German alive that doesn't know what what they did, whether they agree with the interpretation or whatnot, but they were aware that Germany did these things. Austria, and I should say, like a lot of other European countries, yeah. they think it they, they just, it didn't happen, or they're the victims. And, the and victims, I yeah. kind of like to get your thoughts on Austria, but also I think the kind of the unresolved question well, of World War II is all these other nations that participated in this. Yeah. As I tell people on my trips, there aren't enough Germans to do all the things we accuse the Germans of. Right. So, I, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, my Belgian friends like to tell me that Belgium was occupied by 400 Germans. <laughs> I mean, you know, the mayhem that was done in, in, in Belgium and Netherlands was often done by locals, as it was in Ukraine, as it was in Poland, as it was in, in France, as it was in so many of the, in all of the occupied countries. Frankly, but the, the Germany-Austria um, dichotomy is really interesting for me also. My family is Austrian, so, you know, originally that's when my grandfather, after Lemberg, went to Vienna and uh, married an Austrian lady. They ended up moving to Paris, and that was how they survived the war. And my mom was born in Vienna, you know, in, in, in July 1938, so I'm acutely aware of this. Let me, let me answer your question with a little story that happened after the book came out. Uh, I've just written about it, actually. You can, I think everyone can get it free on the New Yorker website, uh, New Yorker online website. I've written up this anecdote. Christmas Day this year, so, you know, a few weeks ago, I wake up in the morning. It's not a day where you get a lot of emails and a lot of activity, but there was an email that came in from a lady in Vienna, a historian, Marie-Therese Arnbaum, and she says, I've just uh, been given the German edition of your book, Die Rattenlinie, uh, I'm an Austrian historian, she says, and I read it with great interest, not least in the first pages, because my great grandfather appears. He was the procurator general, sort of federal prosecutor, chief prosecutor. Uh, and he was removed from office in May 1938. And we have the letter uh, from the person who removed him from office. And we've had it in the family for 70 years, but we could never identify the signature. So we were not able to work out who it was who removed him from his office as the chief prosecutor in Austria, who stripped him of his pension rights and led to him being sent to Buchenwald where he never returned. And she said, because of your book and because of the signature, I'm now able to understand with your what you write in your book that the person who removed him was Otto Wächter. Uh, and that has brought us, uh, it's been interesting for us to know who it was. But she says, that's not why I'm writing to you. The reason I'm writing to you is that I live in my great grandfather, Robert Winterstein's house. And my next door neighbor and dear friend is Otto Wächter's granddaughter. <laughs> and I now have to go next door and tell her uh. about the relationship between our family. Okay, so you really can't invent this kind of stuff. But Austria, which is a place where perhaps Shakespeare's measure for measure, truth is truth, until the end of reckoning as a sort of longer shelf life than many other places to be, uh, should we put it rather generously <laughs> to our dear Austrian friends. You know, these secrets have been buried in the families for years and years and years. I mean, what prompted me to write the piece for the New Yorker was the video, um, which I just watched by accident by governor Arnold Schwarzenegger or actor Arnold Schwarzenegger, 
um, that he put out a few days after the January 6th events in the United States and, and the storming of the Capitol. Um, and he puts out a video, which is completely fascinating. If you haven't watched it, it's yeah, really it's amazing. He basically says, look, I'm Austrian. I know about all of these things. And he proceeds to say, yeah, and my dad would come home after the war. He says, I was born in 47 and my dad would come home after the war and he'd beat us and he'd shout at us. But I didn't get angry with him because I came to understand that it's, you know, shrapnel wounds or what they'd seen and what they'd done. But the one thing he doesn't say is my dad was a Nazi. <laughs> he doesn't it's... just skirts around it. Yeah. That's, I understood that's what he was saying, but, but a reasonable person watching it would not have realized that was what he was saying. So I called Maria Therese and I said, well, what's the reaction in Austria? She said, well, the video didn't really get a lot of airplay in Austria. Uh, and she said, no Austrian can ever say the words, my father was a Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, or my grandfather was a yeah. Nazi. And that, of course, is a theme of the book, because as you know, late, without giving away too much, later on in the book, Horst Wächter's daughter comes onto the scene and she does so with a rather different perspective. And that has had dramatic consequences for the family. Um, so, so, uh, go ahead, Chris. Oh, no, I was just going to say, just following up with that really quickly, because I know we have some questions, but since the book, I know you said that the Vector, the von Vector family is very reticent to talk about this. Has, has any more come out from the family or is it still just poor Horst sort of buried well, across? Well, this is very delicate. Um, and and I, I tried to say, no, no, I mean, it doesn't mean I can't. It's delicate, but it doesn't mean I can't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've tried to stay out of the family struggles and not choose sides. Basically, one part of the family, the large part of the family, they had six children and 23 grandchildren. Most of the family members just don't want to talk about it. The idea is, with silence, it will go away. And indeed, as I recount in the book, in relation to the film, one of the grandsons of Otto and Charlotte. His wife happened to be a student of mine at New York University Law School when I taught there uh, a few years ago, and she contacted me and invited me for dinner with the grandson. And in the course of dinner, at a moment where he had sort of absented himself to go off to the men's room, she says, Philippe, can I just, uh, can I just, uh, can I just ask you a question? And I said, sure, anything you want. And she said, well, could you just you know, make sure your film doesn't get shown in Austria and the book doesn't get published in Austria. And I said, no, but why? And she said, because we have to protect the children. We've managed to keep the Wächter name out of the spotlight. And this is going to bring the family name back into the spotlight. And that's going to be very difficult. So to answer your question, Horst has paid a huge price. Basically, he's been cut off by most of the family members um, because he spilled the family beans and they're upset. And so I find myself in this very curious position. On the one hand, I'm in fundamental disagreement with his denial of what his father did. He doesn't say, my father wasn't there, my father wasn't an SS brigade of Fuhr. He just says, he was there. Yes, he was around when all these things happened, but he didn't want them to happen, and therefore he's not criminally liable for them, on the one hand. On the other hand, he's been incredibly generous. You know, I call him up and say, well, there's a letter that seems to be missing from the file. Could you send it? He sends it. He's been completely transparent. And in case any listeners uh, or viewers are interested, all you need to do now, since last month, it's all on the website of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. You just type in Vechter, U-S-H-M-M, -M, and you've got access to everything except the audio tapes, which have not for some reason gone up yet. And you can just trawl your way through the material. And I think Horst deserves big credit for that because for historians, for researchers, for people like you, for people interested in this program, this is extraordinary material. Well, I mean, that's one of the things that really strikes me about Horst is he's so open. Yeah. But he can't see. Right. And I, but, but like you said earlier, you like him. He seems like a wonderful person, but th th boy, there's just a lot to unpack there. It's really complicated. You know, um, I feel I, I, the deal that I cut with him was that I would give him space in the book to say what he said, even though I disagreed with the views to treat him fairly. You know, my training as a barrister, I'm one of those 
lawyers who wears a wig. We have we take our ethical responsibilities very seriously. We have to be accurate. We have to be fair. We have to treat people with courtesy and respect, even if we disagree with them. And so his argument is set out. And I don't impose my conclusions on the reader. The reader will form their own views. And some of the people will defend him and will take very few, I would say, but some will take his view. But but I feel curiously protective towards him because for me, you know, there's a moment in the film, My Nazi Legacy, which you can get on iTunes and Amazon and you can watch me and Nicholas and Horst spending time in the Ukraine with people wearing buff and SS uniforms. It's pretty shocking. No, we had it. Um, he's a victim. He's damaged. He's damaged. There's a, moment, there's a scene in the film where he describes his birthday party in April 1945. And he knows as a six-year-old, the war's coming to an end. They've lost. Their life of plenty is about to collapse. And he starts weeping. And he's just a six-year-old kid then. And, you know, I'm glad they lost the war, but he's been damaged by that. And he spent the rest of his life trying to reconstitute some semblance of understanding of a deep pain that has befallen the family. How, but, you know, um, there's so many places I want to go, but what about you? You know, how hard is it for you? You have spent years now on the subject matter of a person who uh, killed a bunch of your family. Yeah. And, and you have this, this odd endearing strange tense relationship with somebody whose grandfather killed your grandfather's family i mean that is directly true and so how do you um not you've written a book that's beautifully researched and it tells a fantastic story and it's really interesting but it's not a rant or a scream or a cry it it's not that it's unemotional it's not that, but but how do you how did you keep an even keel? How do you keep an even keel, having spent so much time on this? How long how long have you got, Rick? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <No. laughs> I mean, I'd give a couple of answers to that. Um, just speaking very frankly, firstly, I have the fortune of having professional training to deal with cases of mass murder. That's what I deal with, you know. I deal with 3 million people killed in the Congo, 8,000 killed at Srebrenica, you know, a million killed in Rwanda. I've seen an awful lot of mass graves. I've, I, it's not that you are sensitized to this. These are deeply affecting things, but you learn how to manage the emotions. But it's absolutely the case that when it concerns your own family, it's on a different scale. You know, there's a moment in East West Street, the book that came immediately before you. It doesn't matter what order you read them in it. They can be read in any order. But in East West Street, I describe the moment where two of the prosecutors at the Nuremberg trial learn that the man they are prosecuting, Hans Frank, has killed their entire families. And because I'm a courtroom lawyer, I can imagine that moment. I mean, that I cannot imagine what that would be like to be in that situation. So I've had years to prepare. And I think, you know, speaking openly, not going the English way, where in polite company in England, you don't talk about matters of analysis and talking with people to get professional help. I come from a family that was, you know, involved in the Holocaust and passes things down to the next generations. And there have been issues to address within the family. And I've been very fortunate and having incredible people to help me address those issues. So there is a big passion and there is a big emotion and some of the things I find deeply painful, but I've learned to communicate them in ways that don't, I hope, turn readers off. It's a bit like being in a courtroom, you know. The judge has no interest in how upset you are, in how strongly you feel about something, your job is to lay out the facts, the evidence, the material, fairly, truthfully, with support. And one of the golden rules in international litigation is you never say to a judge, this is what you should decide, judge. And so it is for me with the reader, 
my role i think is to lay out the material as accessibly and as readably as possible without imposing either my emotions or my conclusions on the reader i think for most people it's a blessed relief that i do it in that way but there are a few people who write to me and say you know i just can't understand how you're so unemotional and so i i, I think you've seen i'm not without emotions no and i didn't it doesn't yeah. I didn't think it was unemotional, but yeah. but it is it is fair and it is thoughtful and it is it is, does not go off of an emotional abyss. Yeah, but that's that's by design. That is yeah. by design. It's a it's a writing style. You know, there's a a great Austrian writer um, who I mean, that we're all influenced by other writers, but there's one Austrian in particular, Stefan Zweig, um, who published a book. It was a great writer, but one book in particular he published after his death he committed suicide uh, after the war began he went into exile in brazil and he wrote a book called the world of yesterday and it's the it's his account of of what happened in the 30s and what led to the rise of the nazis and it's a very detached style very precise and i like that style i like it in writers you know one of the characters in the book he happens to be my my next door neighbor, although sadly he, he he passed away a couple of a couple of months ago, a few weeks ago, is the writer John Le Carre, and he has a similar style. You know, for for twenty years, my my job with my neighbor, he would turn up every twelve to eighteen months with a new manuscript, literally printed out at home, and he would say, "Usual job," I'd say, "Yeah, usual job." And my job is to check that the legal characters in his novels are accurate that they dress like lawyers, they speak like lawyers, they are lawyers. And, but having to do that, I had to read the whole darn manuscript, you know, each time in its draft. And I learned to read his detached style. And I think we're all influenced by what we read, by what we hear, by who we interact with. And I think that's had an impact also, that detach, just let the material speak for itself. Uh, is 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 the way i like to do it so so philippe one of the things a question i had you know it's it would be easy to read the book and come away mad at horst or frustrated or whatever but a question i have and i i guess this comes from me showing people around battlefields and whatnot um is there a little bit of horse in all of us you know because one of the things i've noticed is well yeah it's yeah. like i have all these americans and we take them to battlefields in europe and this is the good war and we d-day and all that stuff and and they're really into the battles and the tactics and but they it's very hard for all of us to go okay but the reason these germans that are fighting so well they're fighting to defend this yeah. and and i think as time has gone on the this part is getting left out of all the historiography about, about I, the war. I wanted to tell a really human story. You know, neither Nicholas nor Horst are responsible for what their fathers did, but they live with it. And when I first met Nicholas Frank, it was early 2011. I was doing a case in Hamburg, uh, the International Law of the Sea Tribunal. And I finally found him. I tracked him down and we met. And I was very trepidatious. I was very anxious because as with Horst, this was a man whose father had been responsible for the extermination of my grandfather's entire family. And the moment I met him, I realized this is a decent man. I like this man. He's an honest man. Um, he's not responsible for what his father did. And he's living with this unbelievable burden. I'd never met anyone before whose dad had murdered four million people. And I, for the first time in my life, I was 50 years old, asked myself the question, how on earth do you live with that? You know, I had a friend, I had a friend at university um, in England, in Cambridge, in the early 80s. One of my best friends was an American whose grandfather had flown on the Enola guy. And this was a big issue in the family. This was a big issue in the family. And I think we all are parts of families. We all know, you know, perhaps not on those kinds of scales. And we all have to ask ourselves the question. I've asked myself the question. If my dad had murdered half a million people, would I continue to love my dad or would I hate my dad? You know, how would, would I be Horst? Would I be Nicholas? How would I react? And I, 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 
I put my hand on my heart and say, I, d I just don't know how I'd react. It's still my dad. And yeah. um, that's the reality of life. And it gets passed on through the generations, which is why where I come at is you've got to talk about these things. And the path of silence, uh, uh, that most of the, you know, grandchildren of the vectors do, they don't want to talk about it to protect the children is completely a false and damaging direction because you're, because the truth is there, it works its magic in its nefarious ways, you know, over time. I think we need to talk about things. It's much the better way. Philippe Sands, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I want to apologize to our viewers. We had questions we couldn't get to. And, uh, you know, we could do another hour two of History Happy Hour today, <laughs> and I would happily do it, but I'm not sure that it's uh, fair to you. So we'll, we'll leave that be. But thank you so much for joining thank us. And I want to remind everybody that your book is called The Rat Line, that there's also a, a, a book called uh, it, it, I'm sorry, it's East East West Street, right? East West yeah. Street, yeah. I mean, one thing to say, um, Chris, definitely for taking these tours, I can tell you one gentleman who'd be delighted to have a visit with some of your guests, and that's Horst Vector. Oh, and, no. and the Schloss <laughs> is incredible, as you saw oh. from that photograph you put up, and um, you would be amazed by the library, and uh, I'm very happy to put you in touch with him. I would love to, yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we really you. appreciate thank you being you so here much today. for having me. And thank you to all your wonderful guests, your, your viewers and audience. It's been we, we, we can't we, we also call them guests because they're guests on the tour, but they're viewers today. So it's confusing to us as well. But thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that show. It's really, uh, Philippe Sands was an amazing guest and he's done kind of some really cool work. And so we're delighted to have had him on. And Chris, we are uh, leaving tomorrow, leaving the, the Lovely, uh, you know, of Tavern. London for uh, Normandy. Exactly. It's been a while. We're finally going back. What are we doing there? Uh, there are rumors that we're going to be doing the history masterclass. Wow, there. masterclass in Normandy, and we are going to somehow create something out of this material that we're going to show you guys next Sunday. So I don't know what it's going to be, but I think it's exciting. It's going to be very exciting to be back. Uh, four historians, lots of guests. And lots of Canadians. Yeah. Oh, oh well, well that would be and a little ghost army, maybe. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for That's joining us today. Be safe.